progress. Keeping in step with the spirit. And we all know that each one of us are called to live by the spirit. In Galatians 5.16, Paul writes, So I say, live by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Every Christian, after receiving this gift of salvation, are called, is called to live by the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 Live by the Word of God. As Jesus, uh, quoting from the Deuteronomy 8, chapter 3, he says in Matthew 4.4 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Through the Word and the Spirit, our faith increases. And we're all also called to live by faith. Romans 1.17, Paul writes, The righteous shall live by faith. Righteous meaning we are righteous by the blood of Christ. We are made righteous by the blood of Christ and we live by faith. Again, Paul is quoting an Old Testament verse from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, Thus shall live by faith. To summarize, every one of us today, after receiving the gift of salvation, the rest of our lives will live by the Spirit, by the Word, and by faith. And all these are gifts of God. We receive the Holy Spirit because we believe in Jesus. We grow in faith because Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. And also, the Lord writes the word in our hearts and minds. So everything comes from Him. We only receive from God and use what He gives us to glorify His name. In Romans 8, 14, Paul writes, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Sons mean also daughters, children of God. So the identity of a child of God is that he or she is led by the Spirit. We don't live our lives based on what we want to do, but rather what the Lord wants us to do. And he's given us his Holy Spirit, who is a counselor, encourager, guide, helper in our walk with the Lord. So as we are sensed to the voice of the Holy Spirit, we'll have a fruitful life. When he leads us, we immediately follow. What does it mean to keep in step with the Spirit? In step with the Spirit means, as soon as he speaks to us, we obey in tune with his guidance, step with the Spirit, not ahead, not behind. What's when you're walking ahead of the Holy Spirit? That is, when you take our own decisions in life, you want to do something, you say, I want to do this, Lord. Lord, bless me in this area. Holy Spirit, you give me the strength to do what I want to do. You're moving ahead of God, not, not in step with the Spirit, but ahead of the Spirit. And you want God to, you know, basically, Put a rubber stamp on what you want to do. That's moving ahead of God. What's even in walking behind? Walking behind means after God speaks to us through the Spirit, we wait. We wait. Not immediately obey. Rather, trying to, in a way, change God's mind. Sometimes when God speaks to us about something through the Spirit, we don't like what do you call to do? We try to compromise and say, Lord, Lord, uh, uh, give me some more time. Let me think about it. And people say that I'm praying about it. Once we know the will of God, we should do it. We wait till God speaks. Once God speaks, we act. There are times to pray. There are times to act. When it's time to pray, please don't act. When it's time to act, please don't pray. Many times we find in the Bible, God rebuked his people for uh, acting on their own and not immediately obeying what he says. Not acting upon what God has spoken to them. There's a point of time when the Israelites, led by Moses, came to a place called, what I call Noe, it's called Noeba Beach, at the Red Sea. They I came to a gorge the gorge came in, uh, opened up into a uh, 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 diamond shape.
a beach, Noaiba beach, both sides mountains, in front of them was the Red Sea. They were cornered. Behind them, Israelites were coming. And they were trapped in a way. That place is still there, Noaiba beach is called, on the Red Sea. And when Moses saw uh, the, the, the people trapped there, both sides mountains, like a diamond-shaped beach, in the front of the, uh, was the Red Sea, right and left were the uh, diagonally there were the mountains, and between the mountains there's a gorge, a narrow gorge through which they all they came walking. And they were cornered. And Moses says to the Israelites, 14th chapter of uh, Exodus, 13 to 16, stand firm and you see the Lord's deliverance. And God says, Move on. What are you doing crying out to me? Move on. Without consulting God, Moses says to Israelites, stand firm. You see God deliverance. And sometimes people quote that verse also to say stand firm. This context is not supposed to stand firm. They're supposed to move on. They're supposed to act and not act on their own. So God rebuked Moses for telling the Israelites, stand firm. He said, no, stretch out the stuff. The sea will part. And the sea parted. Another occasion is when Joshua led the Israelites to war and they lost the war against Ai. Seventh chapter of Joshua, we read. And Joshua is lying flat on the ground, crying out to God and asking God, Lord, we lost the war. What will people say about you? What are going to do about your name? Is concerned about God's name, as if he is defending God. And again, God rebuked him. What are you doing down on your face? You are supposed to act, not pray. He is lying prostrate on the ground, crying out to God and, uh, and concerned about God's name. What do people say about you, Lord? You brought your people out here, we have lost the war. How are you going to defend your name? And the Lord rebukes Joshua for praying when he should be acting. You suppose settle sin in the camp. Someone sinned against God. Because of which they lost the war, it's supposed to settle the sin in the camp. So he's praying. Sometimes we are praying when we should be acting. When you walk in step with the Spirit, we will pray or rather have fellowship with the Holy Spirit till He speaks to us. Once He speaks to us, we are supposed to act. And sometimes Christians are notorious for praying after God speaks. I know people sometimes, they want, they're waiting on God to know the will of God for their lives. What should I do in my life, Lord? They pray about it. And supposing they go for a prayer meeting and somebody says, uh, God is sending you to uh, California to be a pastor. Immediately apply for the visa. U.S. Embassy. The Lord told me I'm going to California. But if God says, I'm sending you to interior jungles of Andhra Pradesh, or Orissa, then they will say, I'm going to pray about it. Once God speaks, what are you going to pray about? You're going to change God's mind? And then they want a confirmation. First confirmation, second confirmation, third confirmation. After third confirmation, I'll pray about it. That is walking behind. Once God speaks, you must act immediately. Walking in step with the Spirit means in tune with him. The moment he speaks, we act. In step is best understood when you look at a march past. Every year, Republic Day, 26 January, we have a march past in Delhi. Republic Day Parade. Very interesting it is. And the soldiers mark in step. From the side, when you look at the soldiers marching, you look at only one soldier it is. Perfect harmony. Perfect synchronism. Right leg, left leg, arms, perfect synchronism, in step, not ahead, not behind. So the side looks like only one person, not 20 people in a row. The 20 people in a row approximately. From the side looks like one person, in step, each other's spirit, in each other's feet. In the same way, we are called to move in step with the spirit. And that is a result of a close walk with God. When you have a close walk with God, the moment he speaks, you will know. 
And for us to come to that point of being able to recognize his voice, there are certain things we have to ask God. Ask him for the gift of distinguishing between spirits. 1 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 10 talks about the gift of discerning of spirits, distinguishing between spirits. We have to recognize the difference between God speaking to us, the evil spirit speaking to us, our own spirit speaking to us, and our own minds playing tricks. The delusions of our own minds sometimes can make us think it's the will of God. And when Jeremiah was prophesying, there were other prophets prophesying, they prophesied the delusions of their own minds. Jeremiah 23, chapter 16. Then there are prophets also who spoke from their own spirits. Ezekiel 13, chapter 2 and 3. Their own spirits. And then there were people, Christians also, who can, if you're not careful, get influenced by the devil. He can put thoughts in our minds. For example, when the Lord told the disciples, he's going to go to Jerusalem, be arrested and crucified and killed. 16th chapter of Matthew, verse 22, Peter responds by saying, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked Satan through Peter. Verse 23, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So at that point of time, Peter was influenced by the evil one and he thought he's telling the right thing to Jesus. He was, he was influenced by the evil spirit who put a thought in his mind. Then there are also people who walk in step with the spirit, who spoke by the spirit of God. For example, when Stephen was before the Jewish authorities, it says in Acts 8, chapter verse 10, they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. The word spirit is capitalist. He spoke by the Holy Spirit of God. So Holy Spirit can speak to us. Demons can speak to us. Our minds can speak to us. And our own spirits can speak to us. When you have discernment of spirits, we can recognize and differentiate between all the sources of information. And God, the Holy Spirit is so faithful that he will guide us. He's a counselor, helper, and encourage her. He lives in us forever. And we can easily be moved by the Spirit if we walk in step with the Spirit. No, this is a life, lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. The Apostle Paul exhorted the church in Corinth. It's uh, the last verse of 2 Corinthians 13 chapter, which many Christians refer to as a benediction. In many churches at the end of the service, they have what they call a benediction. And it's usually 2 Corinthians 13, chapter verse 14, where Paul writes, Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit, which means we are in constant communication with him. We talk to him, he talks to us. And how... Deceptively, the evil one has confused Christians to say, don't pray to the Holy Spirit. Pray to the Father. Pray to Jesus, but not Holy Spirit. Don't talk to him. How can you not talk to him? We're supposed to have fellowship with him. He lives in us. And Christ gave Holy Spirit to us for us to have fellowship with him. He's the one who helps us to pray the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26, 27. We don't know what to pray for. He helps us. To pray according to the will of God. He helps us to pray to the Father and to the Son. And also, when I ask Jesus a question, he will answer to the Holy Spirit. In John 16, 14, Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, He will bring glory to me by taking what is from what is mine and make it known to you. The previous verse, he says, He will not speak on his own. John 16, 13. When he, the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you to all truth. He will not speak on his own. 
He speaks only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring Guru to me, but taking what is mine, make him known to me. So every one of us who is born again, and the evidence of that is his spirit lives inside us. First, we have fellowship with him. We can be led by the spirit to pray to God, seek his counsel. Once the counsel comes to be able to do what he wants us to do. So the key to walking step with the Spirit is constantly having fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Talking to Him and listening to Him. That's a calling for every Christian. That's why in many, many churches, including denominational churches, every Sunday we hear the same benediction. Every Sunday. At the end of the service, as a conclusion for the whole service. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. So every Sunday, same thing, because we're not having fellowship. One Sunday, if you listen to that particular benediction and obey, why would God make the pastor say every Sunday, same thing? You and me are not having fellowship with the Spirit. That is why we need reminder every Sunday almost. It's the last verse of the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. So much so as if it's like a conclusion for the whole two, two letters. Ultimately, have fellowship with the Spirit. Now and forevermore. Throughout life. When he learned to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, with discernment, and you know, when he speaks to us, he speaks from scriptures. His language is the scriptures. He is the author of the Bible. Second Peter, chapter 1, 321 says, No prophecy of scripture ever came out with prophecy of interpretation. For prophecy never has origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as a carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament time, every prophet was carried along by the Holy Spirit. They wrote the scriptures by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's why Second Timothy 3, 16 says, all scriptures God breathed. He breathed into every prophet his word. That's why Proverbs 35 says, every word of God is flawless. So language of the Holy Spirit is the word of God. In prayer, helped by him, we talk to the Father in the name of Jesus. And in our fellowship with God, with the Holy Spirit, he will take from Jesus and make known to us. He will reveal God's will to us. He is a counselor. Counselor. In fact, he will fill us with knowledge of God's will through the wisdom he gives us. The Apostle Paul was thankful to God for the church in Colossae. They had faith in Christ and love for each other. But he prayed for them. He's sharing his prayer for the Colossian church. In Colossians chapter 1 from verse 9, Therefore, for this reason, since we heard about you, we will not stop praying for you. Asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through spiritual wisdom and understanding. Spiritual wisdom means wisdom given by the Holy Spirit. When you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, he will give us a rhema of wisdom to know how to respond to situations. And Paul writes here, I'm praying that you'll have spiritual wisdom. By that, you'll have, you'll be filled with the knowledge of God's will for you. His purpose, of, his purpose in your life, his will for you on a daily basis. And he goes on to explain the benefits of that. <coughs> when you pray this, you may live lives worthy of God, pleasing him in every way, Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in his knowledge, and being strengthened with all power of God in glorious might. Five amazing blessings of a life whereby you are filled with the knowledge of God's will through wisdom given by the Holy Spirit. He gives a word of wisdom. So, this fellowship with the Holy Spirit is a lifestyle, it's a second nature to our walk with God. It's natural for a Christian. To walk with God, to obey Him. And hearing His voice is not unusual because 
we are the sheep of Jesus. In John 10, 27, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hands. My sheep listen to my voice. We are his sheep and therefore we listen to his voice. Thank God for the fact we belong to him. So Christian life is all about being able to recognize his voice when he speaks to us. It's basically training to be godly. Godliness is a training. In 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul writes to Timothy, train yourself to be godly. And this is in, in, in practical terms, walking in step with the Spirit, be sensitive to his voice. One example of walking step with the Spirit is Philip. Philip. Philip had gone to Samaria. Someone received the word of God. And uh, the whole town, a city in Samaria, received the word of God. And later on, Philip came back to Jerusalem. And the Bible says in the book of Acts, 8th chapter, an angel appeared to Philip and told him, go down the desert road that goes to Gaza, south road that goes to Gaza. Gaza is south of Jerusalem, on the way towards probably Egypt or Africa. Go down the south road, the desert road that goes to Gaza. Who spoke? Angel spoke. And Philip goes. After the angel spoke, the Spirit spoke to Philip, the Spirit, Holy Spirit. And Philip told Philip, go and stand near the chariot. There was the Ethiopian eunuch who was going to Ethiopia after worshipping God in Jerusalem. The high official for the treasury of Candace, queen of, uh, queen of uh, Ethiopia, is going back home. Spirit tells Philip, go and stand near the chariot. The Spirit didn't tell Philip what to go and tell the Ethiopian. He's, a, he's actually a Gentile. He's not a Jew. And uh, no message from the Spirit as to what he must tell the Ethiopian. The only message was, go and stand near the chariot. And the Bible says in Acts 8 chapter, 29 30, the story is there. Philip ran to the chariot. As soon as the Spirit spoke, he ran. Didn't wait. Didn't ask for confirmation. Asked God for confirmation. He ran to the chariot immediately. Before he ran to the chariot, there was no message to be given to the Ethiopian. He just runs. Obeyed the message. Go and stand in the chariot. He ran. Reached the chariot. He found the Ethiopian reading a particular portion from the Old Testament. Reading Isaiah 53, verse 7, where it says, Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep over share as head, he didn't open his mouth. He's reading that. And then Philip asked him, Do you understand what you're reading? Ethiopian says, How can I understand unless someone explains to me? And Bible says, Beginning from that where he was, Philip went on to speak the good news of Christ. Because the question was, it them asking, who is the prophet speaking about? Himself or someone else? Like a lamb to slaughter, he did not open his mouth. Who is this he? Who is this person who did not open his mouth? Philip, the prophet is someone else. How convenient to talk about Jesus. That's Jesus he's talking about. The word of God. And the Bible says, being from that very verse, Philip went on to preach the good news of Jesus. It's like supposing you got sent to somebody and that man reading John 3.16. And then uh, you ask him, what are you reading? He's reading John 3.16. He says, I don't understand. Who is this person? For God so loved the world, he gives only begotten son. Who's only begotten son? He asked you. How simple to share this Jesus. So beginning that very verse, Philip went on to preach the good news of Jesus, saying that lamb led to slaughter is Jesus Christ. And that man got saved. Now, this happened only because Philip ran to the chariot as soon as the Spirit spoke. He didn't wait. He didn't walk. He didn't ponder. 
He didn't ask for, con- uh, God, uh, God, uh, didn't ask God for confirmation. Soon as Spirit spoke, he ran to the chariot. Till Spirit spoke, he waited. Once Spirit spoke, he ran. Because he ran, he caught the Ethiopian just in time, reading Isaiah 53.7. Just in time. He caught him just in time. Suppose he had waited and asked God for confirmation. He would have gone to 55th chapter, 56th chapter. Suppose he waited a long time with confirmation, first, second, third, fourth, fifth confirmation. In the meantime, he would have gone to Ethiopia. Because Philip ran as soon as God spoke, he caught the Ethiopian just in time reading Isaiah 57. A valuable lesson for us to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit till he speaks. Once he speaks, we act. Please don't wait after God speaks. We wait till he speaks. Once he speaks, we act immediately. When you do that, we be at the right time saying the right things to the right people in the right way. That's the simple way by which we Christians live in this world. Led by the Spirit, having fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He moves the hearts to act. We read in the Bible about how when Christ was born, how God brought different people to Jesus. The shepherds out in the field, the angel appeared to them. They were simple people, simple shepherds. They had a visitation in heaven. They didn't question the visitation. The angel told the shepherds to go to Bethlehem and uh, uh, where the, in the, in the town of David, the Savior has been born. And they go and they see the baby. The wise men who came from the east were guided by a moving star. Matthew 2.9, moving star. It's not a formation of star. That's not astrology. Some people think it's astrology. No. It's a moving star. Matthew 2.9 says the star moved and came to the place where Christ was. So wise men were guided by a moving star. They were wise people. So they could follow the moving star. They could recognize the moving star. They came to where Jesus was. What about Simeon in the Bible? Luke 2.27. He was moved by the Spirit. He was a devout follower of Yahweh, waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was moved by the Spirit. Today, we Christians have Holy Spirit living inside us. You may recognize when He moves us, when He nudges our heart to go and speak to people. And He does it all the time. We're sensitive, sensitive to the voice. He will move us. I remember once in, in 1991 when I we went to Siberia. I was, God used me in two months' time. A lot of people came to believe in Christ. So one day, I was invited by our counterpart, the local company where I was a consultant on behalf of an American company. They had a 50-year celebration of the formation of the company. 50 years celebration. The only company, only one from my company who was a consultant for that company was there. Only one. So I was a chief guest for that function. So that big celebration, a lot of people are singing and dancing and drinking vodka and all kinds of sins were there. I was feeling lost for a moment, sitting there. I had to go because I represent my company as a chief guest. I was sitting there wondering, what am I doing here in this, in this uh, function? They're all drinking and rolling on the ground and they were drink- and then they're misbehaving with women and all kinds of things happening. I was, I was feeling very out of place. And then I was looking at that disc jockey who's playing the music. And the Lord told me, the Holy Spirit said, go and talk to him about Jesus. So I told my uh, interpreter, I want to talk to him about Jesus. The interpreter already knew about my ministry. He had seen a lot of people turn to Christ. So he was already excited. Oh, you want to talk to him? Uh, yeah, I said, yes. I was moved by the Spirit to go and talk to him about Jesus. So I went to the disc jockey, told him, the interpreter told him, that this man wants to talk to you about God. And he, you know, he was, those days we had cassettes, audio cassettes. He was playing loud music for the dancing. And uh, he, the cassette about to finish. So what he did was, he stopped the music. Remove the cassette, put a new cassette. 45 minutes it takes for the whole songs to go. 
He told me, come, let's go, let's go from here. So I went along with him and the interpreter to a neighbor, uh, room nearby, a quiet room. He said, tell me, tell me what you want to tell me. Here music is going on without the disc jockey, dancing, singing, drinking vodka and all, pulling around, all party spirit. Here we are in the next room, quietly talking about Jesus. After 15 minutes, this man gave his life to Christ. His name was Sergei Tamarowski. And with a lot of joy, he accepted Christ. And then he told me, on Sunday, please come to a place where I'll take you. There they talk just like you talk. You know what that place was? It was the underground church. The underground church was meeting in the auditorium of this company where this man was uh, in charge of the music. He was a disc jockey part-time. Main job was looking at the music the sound system in the auditorium. He said, come there. That's how I was introduced to the underground church in Siberia, which became overground. And that was starting point, a wonderful mystery of two months of salvation of people. And in that party, when I, if I had not gone there, this wouldn't have happened. I went there because I was had to go, I was obligated to go. But God used that occasion to bring salvation to Sarga Tamorowski plus many others. And I got introduced to the underground church. The key is to be led by the Spirit. I sometimes made mistakes also. But then God brings me back, makes me understand that I should learn from my mistakes and be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Every one of us who is a believer in Jesus has Holy Spirit inside us. He lives in us. He counsels us, empowers us, convicts us, leads us, encourages us, and makes us understand that listening to his voice is when we are going to have peace and joy. Listening to the voice and obeying him. To obey him, he gives us wisdom and strength. We are not orphans. The Lord told the disciples, I'm not, I'm not leaving as orphans. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. John 16, 7. We are not orphans. We have the Holy Spirit living inside us, who is a counselor who leads us into all truth. So please ask the Holy Spirit to give you a sensitivity to his voice. And to be able to discern his voice, the reference point for discerning when he speaks is not only having the gift of discernment, also to have the word of God in our hearts and checking everything that we hear from people or to directly from God, checking with the word of God. When the Apostle Paul went to Berea, 17th chapter of Acts, we read in verse 11, people in Berea were of noble character, received the word of God with great eagerness, and examined the scriptures daily to see what Paul is saying was true or not. He was an apostle. Apostle means what? The ministry was, uh, uh, was basically identified with miracles and wonders. Second Corinthians 12, 12 says, the marks of an apostle are miracles, signs and wonders. That's the identity of an apostle. That's how I identify an apostle. The ministry is accompanied by miracles, signs and wonders. But Paul ministered the miracles and signs. He had God's wisdom. Peter spoke about Paul's wisdom that God gave him. Wise man. So his, his message was basically by the Holy Spirit's power. In 1 Corinthians, second chapter, 4 and 5, Paul writes, My message and my preaching are not with wise and persuasive words, but the demonstration of the Spirit's power. Demonstration of the Spirit's power. Their faith will not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So even though he was such a powerful man of God, full of his power, full of wisdom, miracle signs and uh, accompanying his ministry, the Bereans checked what he said. They examined the scriptures, they didn't see if Paul is saying is true or not. They compared his teaching with the scriptures. They didn't simply get carried away by his charisma. 
by his personality, by his preaching, they check the content of his preaching. Very important for all of us. Today, all over the world, there are so many preachers, so many teachers. Zoom is a tremendous blessing to many people because through Zoom, we can have access to any preacher anywhere in the world. It's a blessing and also a danger because if you don't have discernment, you can carry away by wrong teaching. Always go by the content of the teaching, not by the gift of speaking of the particular speaker. A man who has a gift of teaching can convince a person with the wrong doctrine because he speaks very well. Don't go by the style and by the gift of teaching. Go by the content of the teaching. A gifted teacher with the wrong content can be very dangerous because the content is what matters not the way he communicates. People get carried away by the way a person speaks, his charisma, his mannerism, his style. Go by the content. Check the content with the word of God. It's not according to God's word. Ignore it. God's people are supposed to hear from God and speak out. Those of us who listen to such a speaker must check everything with scriptures. In 1 Thessalonians, 5th chapter, 1920, Paul writes, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not take prophecy the contempt. Test everything. Hold on to what is good. The two extremes to which Christians can get into in terms of listening to a speaker, supposedly a prophet of God. When he speaks, don't reject whatever he says completely. Don't reject them. Don't treat with contempt. Because if you treat uh, genuine prophecy with contempt, you're putting out the Spirit's fire. Because the word of God from the Holy Spirit is the fire of the Spirit. It's fire. So don't put out the fire by rejecting what somebody speaks. Having said that, test it. Next verse says, test everything. Hold on to what is good. Check scriptures. Check the teaching with scriptures. And then it's from God, we have confirmed in heart, accept it, even though it seems inconvenient sometimes. But it's sort of noble character. Noble character means we take the word of God very seriously and honor it and revere it. Jesus spoke about the seed that fell on fertile soil. Farmer went to sow seed, some seed fell on fertile soil. What is fertile soil? Luke 8.15. Fertile soil refers to people with a noble heart. See, noble heart. Parents are noble people. These people have a noble heart. Who so hear the word of God, retain it, with perseverance produce crop 30, 60, 100 fold. So for God, from God's perspective, a noble person is someone who takes God's word very, very seriously, checks the word of God, hears it, retains it, with perseverance produce crop 30, 60, 100 fold. And since the Holy Spirit is a counselor, when you hear false teaching, he will give us understanding this is false. He will lead us into all truth. John 16, 13. There is no confusion with the Holy Spirit. No confusion at all. 1 John 2, 27 says, The anointing will teach us all things. All things are not will teach us. No confusion. But necessary for us, he will teach us. So therefore, we should train our hearts and minds to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Constantly have fellowship with him. Personal fellowship with him. Early morning, I would recommend to you. And get trained to be tuned to his voice as a way of life. Not just only when you want counsel. As a way of life, good times, bad times. All the time I have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It says in the book of Ephesians 6.18, pray in the Spirit at all times. All times pray in the Spirit. In the Spirit means led by the Spirit. So have fellowship with him every day. 
Doctor, don't feel shy to talk to them. You'll hear a lot of Christians say, Oh, don't pray to Holy Spirit. Only pray to Father. Pray to Jesus. He's the one who teaches you. When you have a teacher, don't you ask the teacher questions? In a school, you go on a college, you go, you interact with the teacher, no? He teaches you, ask questions, you learn together. Why not ask the Holy Spirit uh, answers to questions? I ask. I came to Christ with many questions only. I didn't know the Holy Spirit then. He's with me, pointing me to Christ. When I received Christ into my heart, he came into my heart. So don't feel shy to talk to the Holy Spirit. I talk to him concerning things he does in my life. Teaching God's word. Reminding me of God's word. Give me words to speak to people. To be able to pray, he gives me words. Fills me with joy. Fills me with peace. Gives me faith. Fills me with love. If I lack love, I say, Lord, Holy Spirit, pour the love into my heart, the Holy Spirit. So I talk to him. Fellowship. A two-way communication. Yes, I talk to the Father every day in the name of Jesus. I begin my prayer every morning by saying, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. Then I say, Holy Spirit, help me to pray. You are my helper. Help me to pray. And take from Jesus and make known to me. Counsel me. Encourage me. Comfort me. He's a comforter. Isn't he? he's, he's referred to as Parakletos in the Bible. John 14, 16. Parakletos means counselor, comforter, helper, encourager. When you have fellowship with him all the time, you'll be always encouraged, always comforted, always consoled. Because we go through difficulties in life, we need Counsel, comfort, encouragement. And he provides that for us. He lives in us always. And the moment he instructs you, obey. Don't wait after he speaks. We wait till he speaks. Once he speaks, we don't wait. Like uh, Philip immediately acted. What a wonderful example. I mean, later on after today's study, there's a small passage only, 8th chapter of Acts. Basically, verse 29 and 30, but look at the background to it. How when the Spirit spoke, he ran. Very interesting, the Bible doesn't say he went. Went means you're not sure they walked or ran or what, how he did. Why did he say ran? He didn't waste time after God spoke. He ran. What a beautiful word, just a verb. Ran to the chariot. He not have said ran, he could have said he went to the chariot. When the Spirit spoke, he went. And he said he went, you won't know whether he walked or ran. You have to understand he ran. Because he didn't waste time after God spoke. And also, if you're asked, Lord, Lord, what am I going to tell that person? I'll go to the chariot, but what am I supposed to say? What message should I give? If you're asked the question of the Spirit, you would have told him, you go, I'll give you a message. You want a message before you go, no? You go, I'll give you a message. And Philip didn't ask that. He ran. And he asked, that, you know, what are you reading? So beautiful example it is of being sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And let's be like Simeon, moved by the Spirit. We don't need an angel to come and tell us what we should do. We don't need a moving star to point us to Jesus. We are the Holy Spirit living inside us. We are in the category of Simeon. Moved by the Spirit, we went to temple courts. In our Christian life, we are called to be moved by the Spirit, led by the Spirit. And like I said today, walk in step with the Spirit. May God bless us and give us the wisdom and the strength to send to his voice and not make mistakes.